Greetings to those who watch below. A couple of notes before we begin today. Obviously, Halloween is just around the corner, being next Tuesday. So on the channel to celebrate, I will be giving you a video each day this week. Each video will be a creepypasta or two, though all of them will revolve around something that is present in all of our lives. Fear. Specifically phobias. Also, if one video a day isn't enough for you at the moment, I also am featured in Belladonna Black's Collaboration Week video. I'm going to link that in the description box below for you guys to watch later. So today's fear is something that most of us have had at some point in our lives. Most people grow out of it, but others continue to cower in the corner at night time. Yes, this is nyctophobia. The fear of the dark. And our story, It's There in the Dark, is by J. D. Lucian. You're right to be scared of the dark. You know that feeling you get when your covers are pulled up to your face? When you're lying in the dark with your eyes open but too afraid to look? That feeling that makes you a child again, holding your breath while you say to yourself, if I don't look, maybe it'll go away. If you muster your courage to stare back at the Watcher in the dark, it'll be gone. If you're lucky. I'm not. Let me tell you about when my life fell apart. It was 1982. I was in the kitchen. Mum said there was no such things as monsters. I can hear it now, clear as day. You're too old for that crap. She spoke over her shoulder from the stove. I'd been having nightmares, and she couldn't keep waking up in the middle of the night. Work started early and ended late. That's kid stuff, Johnny. I saw the dark circles under her eyes, and the way her face sagged with the fatigue. She was working double shifts to make ends meet, and it was wearing her thin as a coin passed through too many hands. I need to rest, she said. She wasn't telling me as much as she was pleading and even as a kid I could hear the difference. That made my part in it worse. The pan rattled across the burner, and I could smell the sausages browning. It was Sunday, so breakfast was more than Wonder Bread and Peanut Butter. Grandad sat in the kitchen too. He was drinking his coffee from an off-white mug with a chipped rim. He had a cigarette in his other hand, and when he wasn't taking a drag, his hand was on the table next to his GPCs like he was guarding them. Grandad called them good people's cigarettes. His nose was almost as red as the Marlboros he couldn't afford once he'd been laid off. He coughed, his face blue with the effort. But as soon as he could breathe again, the cigarette was back in his mouth. Mum dropped two links on my plate from the sizzling pan. When I was your age, I was already working hard jobs to help out. I didn't know what to say, so I kept my mouth shut. And I wasn't keeping my folks up half the night. Grandad rescued me. He knows, Tammy. Give it a rest. He looked at me. And I could see that he was asking for assurance. I was just a kid. But also somehow the fulcrum on which the family's troubles pivoted. Maybe that's not entirely true. But it seemed that way to me. I was a mouth to feed. And not keeping the ends from meeting those dark circles, that tired sag that pulled at her mouth. One way or another, life was using Mum up. By stealing her sleep, I was tightening its grip. Shame's heavy, and it bent me just then. Grandad noticed me sagging my chair. Johnny's just shook up. He'll be all right. He didn't look so sure, but he gave me a nod anyway. Right? Yeah. I knew I was lying. So did Mum. But she kept her peace and dropped two dollops of scrambled egg next to the links on my plate. Hi, Cotton. That's what Grandad said about sausage and eggs. I didn't feel it, though. Not that morning. He used a fork to cut the links into bits and mix everything together. I usually liked mine separate and made sure no egg touched sausage. But I watched them meet in the middle as though they were best friends. I'd lost my appetite somewhere so far off that even the smell of Jimmy Dean couldn't call it back. He watched me scooting my sausages around, took a long pull from his cigarette, 
and winked. His eyes were playful, conspiratorial even. Mum joined us with a plate of her own. Shit, she said suddenly. I forgot the toast. In a moment, she was back with a small plate stacked with five or six slices of white bread. A bit more burnt than brown. Eat up, she said. I did. One joyless bite at a time. High cotton. That's what Sunday morning meant. Sunday afternoon was a lazy affair at my house, and this one was no exception. Grandad leafed through old magazines, nodding off now and then. The pages were dog-eared, and he'd read the stories before, but he didn't mind. Mum washed her hair in the bathroom sink and took a long nap. I went outside while Mum slept. It was sunny and hot, and I decided to poke around in the shed. It was under an old maple, and dappled with shade and sun in summer camouflage. The shed was never locked, because there was nothing worth stealing. I opened the door and stepped in. It smelled like rust and oil and old wood, and the light that shone through its window spotlighted the dance and swirl of dust in the air. I poked around a bit, looking for something, anything, that might take my mind off my mum. I had a file in one hand, and I was wearing away at the head of one of the bolts attaching a beat-up vice to the work table. Each push gave a raspy sound and the glint of shiny new steel. One push carried my knuckles too far, and I scraped them across the sharp edge of the vise. It peeled the skin back, and the blood welled up under the curl. I stuck my hand in my mouth and tasted the metallic tang. My knuckles stung, and I winced as I ran my tongue over the flap of skin. Then, I saw it. In the corner of my eye, I could just make out a shadow, blacker than the black against which it stood. Two long arms, with two long hands, and long fingers, that looked more like claws to me. It was just my imagination. No, it's not John. My father's voice. My eyes were on the workbench, but I focused on the shadow without looking. It grew, stretching in the dark, raising those long-fingered hands. My breath caught. I dropped the file and it clunked to the wood floor. I forgot about my knuckle. The hair on my arm stood up and I could feel my heart skipping, starting faster, pounding, trying to escape my chest. I was too scared to look at it directly. I thought about running for the door, but the shadow was right there, just beside it. It had long arms. I'd never make it. I edged into the light from the window, trying my best not to look. I thought that maybe if I just ignored it, it'd go away. But you tell yourself that too, don't you? Late at night? Something in me knew better. Something in you does too, I bet. It was moving, inching toward the mostly closed door. I was pretending not to look, but I took another sideways step into the light. I could feel the sun on my skin. In the light, the darkness deepened. I couldn't make out the shadow anymore, but I knew it was there. It's there all right, Johnny. Don't you doubt it. Now the voice was my granddad's. The door closed with a thud. My chest ached from the effort of keeping my breath in check. I had to do something. I grabbed a hammer, a big heavy one with a painted red wooden handle. You stay away from me, I yelled. I mean it, you just... My words died in my throat. It was there. I could see it now. Blacker than black, getting darker every second. It was creeping closer, sliding like it was on rails. My hand shook, and my lower lip began to quiver. White hot panic burned in my mind, and every thought but run was smoke in its wake. But I was frozen, and my feet wouldn't budge. It stopped at the edge of the light. It slid around the side, staying just beyond the patch of white on the floor. It slid around the side, staying just beyond the patch of white on the floor. It was close, really close. The light was small, but it was everything. Mum wasn't much on church, and she never taught me to pray. 
but I prayed my heart out that some passing cloud didn't happen by just then. I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. I wasn't holding my breath. I was trying to take one, and it wouldn't come. We stood like that for a long time. The hammer got heavy, and my arms ached, but I didn't dare lower my guard. It was trying to get behind me when the shed door opened. What the hell are you doing? My mum asked. She noticed the wet patch on my jeans. What the hell, John? I mean... I stood there, lip quivering, hammer held high, until she took me by the arm and dragged me out into the yard and the sunlight. Sunlight. And into the house. She was angry about my wet jeans, but I didn't care. Mum was making dinner in the kitchen. Grandad and I were in the living room. He was on the couch, and I was on the floor, sitting Indian style. He turned off the TV. I wasn't watching anyway. What's wrong, Johnny? He took a long pull and breathed out through his nose. His face was wreathed in blue smoke. I eyed the window. The sun was setting, and it'd be dark soon. Nothing, I said, trying to guess how long the light would hold, watching the shadows grow across the front yard. Doesn't look like nothing to me, he said. Come up here and talk, man to man. I joined him on the couch, and he crushed the nub of his cigarette into the ashtray. It was brown glass, made to look like amber. What's wrong? he asked, tousling my hair. Nothing. He could see that it was something, and the tousling stopped. He caught my eye with a long sideways look of one milky brown eye. Some men think that they should keep their troubles to themselves, not me. A trouble shared is a trouble lessened, I say. He paused for a breath or two, and I could hear how bad his lungs were. What's your trouble, Johnny? In the shed, well, it was too ridiculous to even say. Kid stuff. It was my mum's voice in my head. You're too old for that crap. What about the shed? Well, I... You saw something, didn't you? I nodded. I thought you might. The nightmares. He coughed. One of the really bad ones that doubled him over and brought tears to his eyes. They're not just nightmares, Johnny. He wiped his eyes and his voice was high and tight and wheezy. Some folks are more... sensitive. The nightmares let you know when it's around. That got my attention like a slap. What did you mean? He had recovered and his hand wandered over to his pack of GPCs. Well, some folks see things that other folks can't or won't. He had my eye again and I could feel his intensity. You follow me? He fished a cigarette out of the pack and held it, unlit, rolling it in his fingers. My gas, I said. You're at that age now. That age when either you stop seeing it, or you start seeing it more than you'd like. The way he said it quickened the hair on the back of my neck. Every follicle was alive and tingling. The shadow? My voice was barely a whisper. Yeah he said. I was stunned. It was like I'd known a secret that no one else can share, and suddenly I found out that everyone already knows. Grandad knew. He'd seen it too. As real as the shadow had been, this was impossible to believe. You see it too? I asked. He looked at the cigarette in his hand, and then back at me. Yeah. Really? He nodded, a slow motion move of his head. You'd be careful, Johnny, he said. Some things lose their power when you say them aloud. I found out then that this wasn't one of them. It was way worse after he admitted that it was dangerous. Way worse. I was about to ask more when Mum came in. She didn't want to hear this, and I knew it, and I couldn't bear to make it hard on her. Dinner, she said. Later, Grandad said. We'll talk about it later. Mum had a double shift the next day and went to bed early. Me and Grandad waited till we were sure she was asleep. I watched the windows like a hawk. It was full dark, and the hair on my arms was at attention. He took one last glance at the hall. Then, his voice as low as a cricket's belly, he said, Johnny, you got to watch out now. Hearing him say it gave me shivers. 
Once it knows you can see it. It'll come for me, won't it? I asked, barely able to get the words out. He was having the same trouble, so he nodded. Millions. Hell, billions of parents tell their kids that there's nothing in the dark that's not there in the light. You've done it yourself, haven't you? You repeat it until you believe it, or nearly so, and you hope your kids believe it too. But maybe it's you who needs to believe. Maybe it's you who need the consolation. Maybe because you know, deep down, that there are things that go bump in the night. I knew it, and so did Grandad. I'm going to watch over you tonight. You'll be safe as houses, I promise. That helped a little, but I'm not always going to be here. I shut my head, but he continued, and when I'm not, you'll need to keep watch yourself. You hear me? Yeah. The word was more breath than speech. Good. When the nightmares come on heavy, that's a sign it's around. Why does it... I'm not sure. Maybe it feeds on us at night, stealing a little bit out of you when you sleep. He lit a new cigarette from the old one and puffed it to life. I think it comes for those who can see it, and maybe it ignores them that can't, or won't. You know what I mean? I did. Even if mum saw it, she would convince herself that she hadn't. I said so, and he nodded. Yeah. His tone told me that he wanted to be a little more like mum. But what can I do? I mean, stay safe. The light, Johnny. Stay in the light. Neither of us could bear to talk about it anymore. There are things you say in the daylight that you wouldn't dare in the dark. Instead, we watched Hogan's Heroes and Sanford and Son with the volume down low so not to wake mum. Normally, we'd have been laughing, but that night we didn't even crack a smile. It was getting late, and Grandad told me to get ready for bed. I had the covers up like a shield. The lamp was on, and my room was fairly well lit. The overhead was busted, but it had always been busted, and there was a problem with wiring. Grandad was in the corner in a battered fabric chair. He was wearing his red and black plaid shirt, with the sleeves rolled up, and he had a big silver Rayovac sportsman with him, the kind that took two D-cell batteries. Something about the chrome reminded me of a knight's sword. I felt a lot better with him there. I'll watch over you, he said. I took my head under the blankets. I didn't want to see. I didn't want to see it. I was tired and scared, but my eyes were heavy. At some point, I fell asleep. I woke up. Grandad was still in the corner, but his flashlight was on and he was shining it under the bed. I sat up and he saw that I was awake. His face was pale as fresh paint and the Rayovac shook in his hand. I could hear the batteries rattling. Don't get out of the bed, he said. What? Why? I rubbed my eyes. I was still groggy. It's under the bed, Johnny. I was wide awake then. Don't get out of the bed, he repeated. He wasn't asking. I jumped to my feet, the saggy mattress bouncing slightly under my weight. What do you mean? It's under the fucking bed. Don't move. I was ten years old, and I had never heard Grandad so much as say shit. This was bad. Real bad. I couldn't stay on the bed. No way, no how. So I ran the step or two to the end of the mattress and jumped for all I was worth. No! Grandad yelled. I travelled too far and too fast and hit the window mid-air, flattening the blinds and tangling in them, ripping them from the wall when I fell backward toward the bed. Toward the bed. Grandad was off the chair in an old man's flash, but my hand was falling into the shadow even as I tried to stop it. Upside down on the floor, I could see it too, flat as a doormat in the shadow under the bed. I snatched my hand to my chest as it reached for me, and not even a hair's breadth separated its fingers from mine. It was cold and misty, like my hand in the freezer to get ice. Jesus, Johnny. I'm okay, I'm, I'm okay, I said finding my feet. I hopped up and down like it was Christmas morning. I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. I was yelling but I didn't know it. Grandad didn't either. But we figured it when Mum burst through the door. What the hell? She yelled, 
her bathrobe trailing behind her like a cape. John? Mac? What the hell is going on? Her hands were on her hips, and her face was as red as Grandad's nose. She pointed a finger at Grandad. If it had been a gun, he'd have been dead. You. Out. He gave me a long, pitiful look that said, What can I do? Mum stood her ground like a titan, and he trudged into the hall past her, his head down, defeated, worried, afraid. Then it was my turn. You. In the bed. But now. What was I supposed to say? That there was a monster under the bed? That I needed Grandad to keep watch? When your kids said the same thing? I picked up the Ravac and leapt into the bed. Not flounced. Not jumped. Leapt. When I get home, John. That threat needed no conclusion. She turned and slammed the door. But not before she switched off the lamp. I sat with a flashlight on, and I knew it wouldn't be enough. I was on the tracks, tied to the rails, and the train was coming, and there was no hero waiting just off screen to run in and save the day. It was really dark in there, and there wasn't even a light peeking under the door. It was in its element. I could hear Mum giving it to Grandad in the kitchen down the hall, but I couldn't concentrate on the words. My heart was at least as loud as her cursing, and my mouth felt like it had never known a sip of water. I held the Rayovac in one hand like a spear, and I was shining the light at the edges of the bed, moving frantically from this side to that, from the headboard to my feet and back again. It was waiting, savouring my fear. You know how it does that, don't you? That's when Mum came in. In the instant before the ball blew up, she saw it, and her mouth dropped open, and her eyes grew, just like they did on Saturday morning cartoons. I heard her take a loud breath, the substance of a scream filling her lungs, but it was black now, and there was a rush of air, and she was gone. She was gone. Gone. I was screaming, tearing at the doorknob, running down the hall toward the light. My socked feet slid on the kitchen floor, and I smashed into the cabinets hard enough to send my head spinning. The Rayovac skittered across the tired, yellow linoleum. Grandad overturned the table. He saw something too, because it was a few minutes before I could get him to see me or answer my frantic questions. It had been right behind me in the hall, all the way to the edge of the kitchen. We waited there till morning. That sounds crazy. I know it, but we did. Even then, every light in the house was on as we searched my room for mum. Of course, we never found her. Folks think she ran out, just like dad did, that the double shifts and bills and me and grandad were just too much in the end. We knew better. I knew better. That was 1982, a long time ago. Grandad and me had a hard time of it, and soon enough, I was working those odd jobs to make ends meet. They never really did, not even close. Grandad passed before too long, and I got more help from the state and foster care. The Willises weren't so bad, and Fred and Rita did as well by me as they could. I sold the house when I turned 18. I have stacks of bulbs in the kitchen closet, 60 watts, 100 watts, fluorescence, you name it. My lights are all rigged to a master switch in each room too. One flip and everything's lit. I won't have it any other way. When the nightmares come, and they do come, I keep the lights on all night. The Rayovac's been replaced by a maglite rechargeable, and I keep a Q-beam by the bed, just in case. Every room has a few lamps and an overhead. The wiring's like new. I want you to know, when you get that terrible feeling, that feeling of being watched from the dark, you're not alone. When you pull up the blankets like a shield, and slide your head down and pull your feet up, I do too. When you feel it watching from the dark, or pull back a cold hand dangling over the side of the bed, when you feel like a kid, and try to tell yourself there's nothing there but your imagination, even though you know there's something there, there is. Kids go missing all the time, don't they? And sometimes they die in their sleep, even though there's nothing wrong with them. 
and sometimes parents just get up and go when they've had enough. But maybe, just maybe, not all those kids run away. And maybe, them that died see something before they do. And sometimes, just sometimes, those parents didn't run off when times got hard. And you're right to be afraid of the dark and what's in it. Greetings again to those who watch below. I really hope you enjoyed this video today. If you did, please make sure to like, share, comment and subscribe to the channel. And if you're already subscribed, make sure you hit that notification bell. That way you'll know when the latest creepy video hits. If you have a tale that you want telling, please make sure you let me know via my email in the description box below. So, until next time, sleep tight.